welcome. My name is John Latiri. I'm the president and CEO of the Economic Innovation Group. We're a bipartisan research and public policy organization devoted to building a more dynamic and inclusive American economy. I'm joined today by a very special guest, Congresswoman Terry Sewell from Alabama. Congresswoman Sewell is in her sixth term representing Alabama's seventh congressional district. She's one of the first women elected to Congress from Alabama and is the first black woman to ever serve in the state's congressional delegation. Congresswoman Sewell sits on the House Ways and Means Committee and serves in House leadership as a Chief Deputy Whip. She's an honors graduate from Princeton University and Oxford University and received her law degree from Harvard Law School. She brings to her work in Congress more than 15 years of experience as a securities and public finance attorney. And I can say personally, I've really appreciated the chance to work closely with her and her team over the years. So Congressman Sewell, welcome. Thank you so much, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, conversation. So I wanted to start by talking about the district you serve and how that shapes your perspective as a policymaker. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about the symbolism of the 7th District in terms of the country's journey towards greater equality uh, socially and economically. So how do these issues of geographic inequality play out, including the urban-rural divide uh, in your district? And what kind of symbolic importance does your district have for, for this country's journey? Well, first, let me just again thank uh, the uh, uh, EIG for all that you do um, and the opportunity to work closely with you on policy. I get to represent my home district, the district that I grew up in. In fact, I interned when I was in college for my member of Congress, who was Richard Shelby. He's now this US Senator from Alabama. He's a Republican now, but he used to be a Democrat. So I guess I'm, I'm dating myself. Um, but my district is a very historic district. It includes the cities of Birmingham, Montgomery, uh, Tuscaloosa, Roll Tide, <laughs> and my hometown of Selma, Alabama. In so many ways, it's America's civil rights district. And when I think about um, geography and sort of spaces and places have just as much to do with um, where my district is located as it does with the mission and the people who were so instrumental in bringing about the social change. Um, I grew up in Selma, Alabama, that bridge um, that everybody has heard about, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where um, foot soldiers like John Lewis and Amelia Boynton Robinson were bludgeoned on that bridge during Bloody Sunday in 1965 which ultimately brought us the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which I truly believe is one of the most consequential pieces of civil rights legislation that we have. Um, it all happened in my district. The same is true with the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church where four little girls' lives were lost. And frankly, it was that visual of domestic terrorism that really ignited um, Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So I often say that my district, uh, really not only brought us some very consequential um, civil rights legislation, but it's a district that's rich and, rich and steeped in history. And um, the places and spaces where the movement took place were just as important as um, you know, the people and the, the mission that they had. And so um, you know, everything from the, the churches that held the mass meetings, which are now a part of the uh, Selma to Montgomery Trail, uh, to, um, you know, the bridge and the jail cell where J Martin Luther King wrote um, a Birmingham letter from a Birmingham jail. Those were also really important. And my district includes um, cities like Birmingham, but it also includes rural communities. Selma is only 19,000 people. And so it is sort of the queen city, it's called the queen city of the Black Belt. And um, it sort of sits in the center, but all around it are smaller rural communities, which used to be a part of the cotton belt. Uh, and so that meant that slave trade was uh, alive and well in Alabama and that labor that, that fueled the economy of the deep South um, and the Southern Confederacy um, was very much uh, present in my district. And so when you think about this, uh, this country's journey towards a more perfect union and towards racial, racial equality, and justice, um, it was very much, uh, you know, centered around the Deep South. If we could get it in the Deep South and figure out ways that we can bring about racial equity and um, at least uh, provide um, opportunities for everyone and all Americans, uh, it was definitely in the Deep South and in my district. So I, um, I often say that my, while my job right now is to uh, definitely provide better opportunities and better resources for the people that I represent today, it also is about preserving and furthering the legacy that is, that is the seventh congressional district. That's a legacy of civil rights, of voting rights, uh, 
a legacy of equity, frankly, uh, racial equity, economic equity, environmental equity. Um, so it's a, it's a district that, uh, that shares many of the problems uh, that the Deep South has had and frankly, um, you know, is ripe to um, also be a part of the revitalization and reawakening that I think the, the, that, you know, George Floyd's um, death, his murder, uh, really ignited during the middle of this uh, pandemic. So um, it's a great, a great district full of amazing places, but also amazing spaces. We've talked about your district and that, that was a wonderful overview. Uh, we wanna talk about you and your personal journey as well because you have a, a unique and really powerful story yourself. You, you've straddled multiple worlds. As you said, growing up in Selma and then Princeton, Oxford, Harvard Law, now the halls of Congress. Uh, how did that journey inform your vision as a policymaker? What, what does that help you bring to your work as a policymaker dealing not just with the issues of your state and district but the entire country? What perspective does that give you? Yeah, no, I think that growing up in Selma, where, I mean, I didn't have to read in the history books about John Lewis. He would come year in and year out. So would um, Coretta Scott King when she was alive and uh, T.C. Vivian and, and so many of these amazing historic icons. I got to literally hear in my home church of Brown Chapel AME Church, which was the church where the marchers led the march from Selma to Montgomery and where after they were bludgeoned on that bridge, they came back. So, you know, those foot soldiers, those um, amazing people who fought for justice would come back year in and year out to remind us of what took place in Selma and in Birmingham and to, to remind us that we should never go back, that this, that, that was a very dark part of America's um, life. But at the end of the day, it could happen again. And in fact, I, I dare say old battles have become new again. Um, while we don't have to count how many marbles are in a jar, the fact is that we're seeing um, voter suppression alive and well across the United States as state legislatures in response to the 2020 presidential election have been, uh, you know, um, uh, they've been introducing voters, you know, very uh, modern day barriers to voting, uh, whether it's cutting the number of, um, of hours that, uh, that one has to vote um, uh, or are closing down mailbox, mailboxes and opportunity to do mail-in voting um, or even just providing water <laughs> and some food to, to voters that are standing in line. When I think about what informs my decision, it's definitely my life experience of growing up in that environment. In fact, um, you know, not only did I not have to read about them, when I think about some of the unsung heroes of the civil rights and voting rights movement, they were my neighbors. My babysitter was like an eighth grader sitting on the laps of um, of Martin Luther King during the 60s um, and marched across that bridge it's at 10 years old. And so, you know, I, I, it definitely informs who I am as a person. I love to say that, um, that I am the seventh congressional district. I represent the very best that it has to offer, but I also represent the frustrations of that district. It's a district that the median income for a family of four in 2021 um, terms is uh, $34,000 for a family of four. But what we lack in economic prosperity, I often say we more than make up for in heart and spirit and fight. I come from great stock, people who were ordinary Americans who dared to, to challenge America's, uh, America to look up to uh, its idea, live up to its ideals and its promise of justice and equality for all. And um, so my, my challenge, though, is how can I leverage that history, those amazing historic places uh, and spaces to actually benefit the economic revitalization of the, of the communities that I represent. Hmm. And so, um, you know, um, I, I never forgot where I came from. While I, while both literally and geographically, the biggest leap that I had to take was from Selma High School to Princeton University. The, the other uh, leaps in my life were a lot smaller, Princeton, Oxford, Oxford, Harvard Law School partner, law firm, you know, member of Congress, those were small steps. <laughs> the big step was really going from a public high school in Selma, Alabama to Princeton. And, you know, I, it was the people that back home that grounded me, that told me that I was smart and that I could do anything and be anything I wanted to be. And I believed them. So even when I went to a place like Princeton where I was frankly, woefully unprepared, um, yes, I graduated valedictorian of Selma High School, but no one in my school had ever gone further north than, um, you know, than, the, than, um, than Howard University, frankly. Um, no one had really gone to an Ivy League school. 
So I was woefully behind in so many areas. But it was those folks that reminded me and told me often that if I didn't know something, it was because I wasn't taught it. That if I was taught it, I could learn it, I could master it. Um, and so I never, even in my darkest moments of studying in the bowels of the library, ever doubted my ability to learn and to, um, um, and to be you know, a productive member of society. In fact, you know, the confidence that I often bring to so many arenas that I'm in, that comes directly from coming from amazing people who literally um, you know, taught me uh, the importance of uh, fairness, the importance of justice, the importance of fighting to maintain the progress that we've made as a nation, but also contributing to it, figuring out how I can use public service. And so the opportunity to have a full circle moment, to be the intern uh, in, in the, in the 19, um, 80, late 80s, um, and then become the member of Congress, you know, uh, uh, to, of the same district was a great opportunity. But I have to tell you that the, the district was the poorest district in the state of Alabama when, when Shelby had the district as, um, as a member of Congress. And then, you know, 26 years, 30 years later, we're still the poorest district uh, in the state of Alabama. And so, you know, the opportunity to study abroad and to, and to experience different cultures, um, the opportunity to um, really broaden my horizons. I inform so much about my district, you know, what I do for my district, everything from fighting for rural hospitals and trying to get young folks who are from these rural communities that I represent and urban underserved communities that I represent to actually go into public service, to become doctors, to, to you know, um, figure out ways that they can pay back their medical bills by or medical um, school schooling um, by coming back to those areas and giving of themselves and their and their talents to help home um, is something that I truly believe in. It's why I came back to Alabama after practicing law in New York City. Um, it was because I, when I thought about where I wanted to make a difference, I couldn't imagine a better place to want to make a difference than back home. You have an incredible platform in Congress. You're a member of the Ways and Means Committee, as I mentioned in my, my intro of you, and that's that's known to be one of the most powerful and, and uh, agenda setting committees in Congress. Obviously, tax and trade and Social Security and a, a number of very and healthcare <laughs> and healthcare and big ticket issues that have enormous influence over the uh, direction of our economy and about this this broader push for uh, equality on a number of fronts: individual inequality, inequality uh, wealth inequality, and geographic inequalities. We'll talk about a bit later. But one of the things that's new this Congress is that you serve as the co-chair of the Racial Equity Initiative uh, on the Ways and Means Committee. Can you tell us about uh, that? That's a, that's a, a kind of a new uh, effort uh, that the committee's undertaken. What are you hoping it's going to accomplish and how does that lay the groundwork for a more equitable country in the years to come? Very good question. You know, it was really the, the brainchild of our chairman, Chairman Richie Neal. Um, as the Biden administration was coming into um, you know, new administration was coming into power. Um, President Biden really, I think as a result of sort of the triple whammy that this nation went through during this pandemic, um, which threatened our very lives, our livelihoods. And then we saw an attack on our democracy, not just with, um, you know, George Floyd, but frankly with uh, January 6th and uh, what happened um, um, in the seas of the Capitol. So, you know, I think that what he had hoped is that we would think about the policies that we got to draft and to inform as a members of Ways and Means through an equity lens. And he asked me to be a co-chair along with um, Jimmy Gomez and uh, Congressman uh, Stephen Horsford. And our objective was to try to figure out in the legislation that we were, um, you know, uh, that we were putting together as a part of the American Rescue Plan, as a part of the Build Back a Better agenda, even as a part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. How do we um, bring about better equity, racial equity, but, but in tackling racial equity, you could close the opportunity gap, the economic gap, and the environmental injustice that often happens in uh, communities of color. Um, and so um, that was our goal. And in, in fact, I think that we did a great job of trying to um, uh, address that and in being intentional about the kinds of policies that we were promulgating um, for, the, for the Build Back Better agenda. For example, uh, you see a great emphasis on um, three-year-old and four-year-olds having universal pre-K, um, acknowledging that so often it's educational um, 
um, lack of educational opportunity has held back many communities of color. And if we can level the playing field at an early age or try to at least address the, um, the inequities at an early age, we help our whole society and definitely those communities um, you know, um, get a leg up. Um, likewise, we saw um, in um, health disparities and trying to address health disparities, being intentional in our efforts to get more um, uh, healthcare professionals, not just uh, across the board, but intentionally in rural America, in underserved communities, um, was something that was spotlighted and actually featured in the bill that came out of Ways and Means. Um, and, you know, um, that's just some of it, or, or even like uh, when we think about um, environmental injustice and the real need to address climate change, how can we provide greater opportunities um, for um, you know, leveling the economic playing field to rural and underserved communities by targeting um, the, the skills and training that goes along with um, you know, the, the new industry that's gonna come out of this green, uh, uh, green New Deal. And I think that that um, that will also help not only uh, displace workers, but it'll also help our, our whole um, effort globally to uh, be prepared for climate change. And so, um, you know, we, we really did try to come up with policies in, um, in all three, when I think of three, healthcare equity, environmental equity, and, and economic equity. And so across the board, I think that we did a, a really good job of educating members about uh, being intentional uh, and trying to figure out ways that we can um, really make a difference in, in this, um, um, you know, make a di difference in America. And, and frankly, those are challenges. I mean, look at what's possible from a district that's poor, underserved, with resources and opportunities. I get to live that every day. Mm -hmm. And so what a, uh, to use my voice, to sit at, at, in tables and in, in rooms that people who look like me often don't get a chance to do, to speak up and speak out about providing a hand up and not just a hand out to these communities is critically important. What often gets lost in the economic conversation in this country uh, is what's happening on the ground in communities. That just because the national economy may be doing well and growing, uh, the idea that uh, that doesn't reach everywhere and to every resident of every community, that there's a deep unevenness, particularly in recent decades, this is something that you, uh, as you said, that plays out in your district in a very vivid way. And I think as a result, it's informed what's become an agenda in, in Congress that you're known for being a, a policymaker who puts place firmly in the center of the agenda. So you're a champion of policies like new markets tax credit, of opportunity zones, and of doing more through federal policy to target places that are lagging behind and where economic opportunity is not as easy to come by. I certainly have, have noticed a shift in the conversation in the last decade or so uh, about place. Are you seeing that in, in Congress? Are, are, are policymakers more place conscious today when it comes to the economic agenda than they were when you first came to the Hill? Yeah, I think that people, um, I, I know for me, when I think about helping the rural communities in my district, and like I said, Selma is really at the heart of a lot of the rural communities that I represent. Um, and, you know, it's about reaching across the aisle and partnering with Republicans that represent similar types of districts in Tennessee and West Virginia and, you know, Florida, across this nation, and really trying to be um, intentional in realizing that where you live shouldn't determine um, the quality of your health care. You, you shouldn't be able to, you know, the quality of your life, the air you breathe, the water you drink shouldn't be, um, you know, determinate by, the, by your zip code. But in reality, there are two Americas, there are actually multiple Americas, but definitely um, the haves and the have nots. And that gap, that wealth gap has only widened during my decade here in Congress. And so being uh, targeted and intentional about focusing on where people live and delivering the resources and the services that they need to uplift themselves where they can get it uh, is critically important. And so, you know, for me, um, as a reform public finance lawyer, um, you know, I think that uh, understanding how you can, the federal gov government can incentivize the behavior we want to see. If you want to see better economic development in underserved communities, then having new market tax credits that are targeted towards, um, you know, giving the incentive for developers and, and uh, you know, and, and industry to come to those uh, places 
is going to be critically important. And using the tax code, using our healthcare policies, using our educational policies and our environmental policies to be intentional about uh, addressing the disparity that exists in places is just as important, I think, as um, making sure that we are, um, you know, as a nation, um, advancing economically and competitively and, in, and innovation-wise globally. So, you know, I think that it all kind, uh, kind of makes sense. And I do believe that um, being very intentional about rural communities and trying to, um, you know, uh, uplift them um, is, uh, is something that has been at the heart of a lot of the tax policies and a lot of the um, new market tax credits, historical tax credits that I've tried to do, as well as bringing back advanced refundings, um, because we know that this low interest rate gives an opportunity to local municipalities and, and um, you know, those, the, these tax exempt bond, hold, bond uh, issuers an opportunity to take advantage of lower interest rates. So, um, yeah, I think that, um, that, uh, that I've tried to sort of leverage across the aisle in a bipartisan way um, the importance of space and places uh, in my district. Well, one of the new tools in the toolkit, obviously a, another aspect of the Ways and Means Committee's work is the Opportunity Zones Incentive. And what's interesting is that Alabama and your district in particular has become uh, nationally recognized for its early success, even though the policy itself is still pretty new. Right out of the gates, it seemed like you had a lot of people in Alabama, including in your district, that were putting that to work on some tough uh, challenges. You want to talk about that? I know that the same. Yeah, I would love well, to talk about. It. You know, my hometown of Selma, we have a we have a, a hotel that is a boutique hotel of Hilton that came about through uh, through Opportunity Zones. Look, I've always been a person who believes that you know, irrespective of whether there's a Republican in the White House or Democrat in the White House, my job stays the same. It's to use the policies, leverage the policies that exist um, um, to help bring about better economic opportunities and better growth opportunities for the people I, uh, I represent. And so while you know, it was under the Trump administration and a Republican-led you know, house that, that passed Opportunity Zones, I gave you know, Tim Scott all of my, I mean, he didn't adopt a lot of the things that I said because I wanted more targeted stuff, but reality is Opportunity Zones was a great way to uh, immediately uh, provide some economic opportunity in places that otherwise wouldn't have gotten it. So we've used in my district alone, Opportunity Zones for hotels, for hospitals, uh, for housing, um, and I've been pretty, uh, pretty excited about the fact that the state of Alabama and the governor, to give her credit, really early on identified in all 67 counties in Alabama an opportunity zone, thereby giving, you know, giving me with 14 counties, 14 opportunities <laughs> to, uh, to try to leverage opportunity zones to help, um, help in the economic revitalization of those communities. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the St. James Hotel is... Uh, one example of that, but we've been able to utilize it as well for hospitals and for um, manufacturing facilities um, uh, throughout our district. That's great. Build back better. That's uh, that's uh, a big a big effort working its way through Congress now, and and you have uh, played a key role in some of those debates. Uh, talk to us about the Build Back Better agenda. What are the key elements that? are most important when it comes to that conversation about place and distressed communities and what we can do to really elevate policymaking with more of a place consciousness. What, how, are you, how are you viewing that process? Well, you know, when I think about the fact that Alabama, unlike a lot of Southern states, uh, did not expand Medicaid. And uh, one of the things that was a big priority for me was to give, um, to make permanent these subsidies that allow uh, the people in my district who are the working poor um, they don't make enough, uh, they make too much money, so they're not on Medicaid as it exists in Alabama and a lot of these Southern states, but they don't make enough money to be able to afford health insurance. Uh, and so making good on the promise of the Affordable Care Act by making permanent some of those um, subsidies and those, uh, you know, providing, you know, resources for these premiums is critically important. Um, likewise, making permanent the child tax credit. I mean, that's been uh, hugely transformational in my district. Um, you know, uh, just by giving the $300 in a quarterly, in, you know, in quarterly increments instead of giving it, uh, sorry, in monthly installments instead of making it quarterly um, was a huge thing and making it fully refundable so that some, so, so that a lot of the folks in my district who don't make enough money to file income tax at all gets that benefit. They're the main ones who need the benefit, frankly. Um, that's critical. 
um, earned income tax credit for single folks, enacting paid family uh, and medical leave. What a game changer uh, for um, American families, prioritizing job job training and financial support for individuals uh, in distressed communities, expanding access to clean energy and also providing training and skills training around that. Um, all of those are really important provisions within the Build Back Better, which I think will not only um, serve us all well, but will definitely um, go a long way towards addressing the, the differences that we see in, in, in different geographical areas. I mean, um, I, 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 I venture to say that the fact that um, so many Southern states are being, you know, are slow to get vaccinations and, and, and the like, we've got to be intentional <laughs> of, about addressing just how we, in, how, we, uh, how we disseminate information, how people in different parts of the nation, you know, receive information <laughs> um, and being intentional about uh, making sure that we have uh, people who look like the folks that we're trying to target um, delivering those messages and providing that information and helping people make more informed decisions, I think is uh, also important. We've just been living through one of the most uh, challenging and unique times, not just in the American economy, but in policymaking, where we've seen this massive, uh, massive response that spanned two different administrations now, two different Congresses. You, we've talked about your district and what a microcosm of, of certain national challenges it represents. How do you grade our response? And so nationally, how do you think about what we've done and how that compares to previous crises perhaps? But on the ground in your community, how are you seeing the effects of policymaking, either for good or bad, uh, helping to, to respond to that, that national challenge? And, and what does that meant to your constituents? Well, you know, look, I'm a tough grader. Um, um, so I would probably say that we have a long ways to go in order to really try to close the opportunity gap that exists upon rural versus urban, underserved communities versus uh, communities of privilege. And we, we have to be more intentional about it. And I know that um, for, for the successes that we have seen in terms of fighting this war on poverty and trying to close the gap, um, there are often policies that, that bring us right back to um, you know, square one or, or put us you know, as much as, you know, progress to me is elusive. We make progress, this country often retreats from that progress. I mean, who would have ever thought that I would still be fighting, that I would have the same cause that John Lewis had, um, you know, fighting for the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to be fully restored so that the full protections are there for all Americans, 56 years after the Bloody Sunday, or that reproductive rights are being threatened. Um, surely my mom's generation won that war. Um, we, we're still seeing, you know, um, as much as we see progress, we can sometimes sometimes um, see retreat. Oftentimes, we'll see retreat. So we have to be. Uh, every generation has to fight for the progress that we've already made, and 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 do their very best to advance it moving forward. So there's still a lot of work to do when I think about addressing racial equity in this country and economic equity in this country, uh, environmental equity in this country. Um, so many of the Superfund sites that I have in my district are in poor underserved communities, whether they're urban or rural. And it's just unacceptable for us to not fully fund the Superfund to actually clean up and remediate, you know, um, remediate those areas. So I think that um, we have a long ways to go, but I also know that the only way we can get there is by seeing that we have more, we share more in common than that divides us, whether that's the South versus the North or urban versus rural, that, that all of us want quality healthcare and affordable healthcare. All of us want our children to be able to learn and reach their God-given potential. All of us want to live in communities that have opportunities for us and our families. Um, and all of us want to have access to affordable um, quality healthcare. And so I think that seeing our commonality and, and, um, you know, and trying to build on that, as well as leveraging these communities have to band together and, and, and really fight um, you know, for the limited resources we have to come to those communities. And I think that that is not a Democratic fight or a Republican fight, that's an American um, fight. And, and that um, the sooner we sort of see that we're all in it together and it's not a race to the bottom, but a race to the top. Um, and unless you lift as you climb, we're not gonna get there as a nation competitively.
um, we just that's a great way to uh, to close us out. Congresswoman Sewell, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.